Yeah, I didn't see the camera set up for a while. Usually I see Joey over there with AV equipment. Yeah. And I kind of went through my talk and said, oh, I can really like say some more <laughs> scandalous things. Now I need to remember not to say them. Because people find stuff on the web from so long ago and um, send you questions about it, which is uh, pretty frightening sometimes. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk today about embracing dash dash AI. And the idea really is not so much a code talk as it is just about the idea of the architecture of building your one web app as if it were two web apps or just two different apps uh, straight, straight from the beginning. Uh, me, if you don't like looking at people directly, you can see what I look like over there and there. Uh, in real life, my name is Mitch Lloyd on Twitter, 2Mitch, and uh, GitHub Mitch Lloyd. And I finally have this email address working. Uh, it was not working for a while. Uh, so it would be very easy to stand up here and say, um, oh, you know, if you're going to build the next Gmail killer, you're going to want a separate client app and a separate backend app. Um, I think we'd all say, no duh, right? Uh, this term here, uh, as a matter of course, this is something I heard uh, Josh Susser say on some uh, Ruby podcast once. And he was arguing about dependency injection with uh, DHH, and he was saying that as a matter of course, he would just pass time into a function that was using time instead of just calling out to the current time. And it wouldn't be a matter of, well, for this particular use case I need it. It's just the default, and he would need to hear a reason why not to do that. And that's kind of what I want to argue here, that we're at an inflection point where um, to make a new web app, uh, for most web apps, uh, it should be a matter of course to separate it into a front end and a back end uh, application. So uh, dash dash API, uh, I was going to try to do the, the audio thing, but I don't know, it, it didn't really work. But uh, I was actually at this opening keynote uh, where DHH introduced dash dash API. And yeah, maybe I should just play it and let, let you see some of the body language, but I don't know if I can get over the screen. Oh, I can. We'll see, maybe it'll make some noise. I doubt it. But in this talk, he, he kind of introduces dash dash API. Uh, he does it with a ton of sarcasm, as you can see. Uh, shakes his head, and he says it's just like the perfect framework for microservices. And basically, if you want to use it, go ahead and knock yourself out. And uh, <laughs> you know, you won't blame me at the end of the day, and your app will be horrible in two years, and I'll be off doing like better things. And we can all work together. That's kind of how he ends it. <clears throat> so this to me, I mean, as I was there in the audience, I mean, I thought this must be the most reluctant feature reveal of all time. Uh, it was so clear he wasn't into it. And the message was really just, I hate all of this. But like, all right, like we can still work together. <clears throat> and so what is dash dash API? Uh, like technically, it removes your views directory. All right, one less directory. Uh, some middleware is gone. I tried to look what the difference was. It was hard to find out quickly. Uh, no asset pipeline, and you get these active model serializers uh, by default to serialize models into JSON. Um, but yeah, that's not the most interesting part to me. I assume there's some negligible performance gain there. And um, really, I want to talk about uh, this idea of using uh, dash dash API for your next Rails application. <clears throat> uh, and in this talk, I'm going to talk about how JavaScript uh, for most web applications is inevitable. Hopefully, that doesn't take too much convincing. Uh, then I'm going to talk about why I believe that client-side render rendering is actually simpler to use than to avoid it. And then talk about uh, some of the emergent benefits that you might not think of uh, if you do end up separating your web app in this way. So JavaScript being in uh, inevitable. Uh, yeah, clearly you could make an argument and say, well, I have a web app that is you know, fine. It uses Rails scaffolding, and it does not use any JavaScript, and, and it works very well. And those kind of like whiz-bang UI things aren't you know, important to my type of uh, customers. And it's true for so many business applications, you know, if you're doing something that used to take somebody hours to do in spreadsheets, now you do it in like half a second, like that's a giant uh, improvement. But I've said this to myself so many times, this web application is so simple, it's not gonna need any JavaScript or just hardly any JavaScript. Uh, and even when I was just like, really into sort of all these front-end frameworks, when it came time to build a client's application, I was like, this is a total mess. Like, if we can avoid this, we're going to you know, have such a gain. Let's just uh, try to avoid it from the start. And so you start off in your no JavaScript kind of smiley face land. And then pretty soon you get dragged into this sort of just horrible middle zone where you've got uh, like some JavaScript on the front end, your server's responding with some other JavaScript, and you can never get over to that like UI JavaScript party that you imagine on the other side. And we get dragged over there by user expectations because people use 
like native apps, they know they've used Outlook, they use Excel, they have expectations. And now that people are starting to deliver more native-like experiences on the web, uh, they're, you know, they're not gonna be satisfied with you delivering a web app that basically looks like an API, right? Index, shell, like save it, here it is again with a flash message. Uh, you know, it just, just doesn't cut it. Uh, yeah, so back to DHH's sprinkles. Maybe the other argument here uh, for uh, why this might not be, you know, an approach that really helps you get rid of JavaScript. I think nobody at Basecamp would say they don't write JavaScript. Uh, in 2012, one of their employees said that they had 50% uh, Ruby and 50% CoffeeScript. So I'll, I'll argue that after compiling, it's more JavaScript than Ruby. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, I mean, you know, they're in the business of writing a JavaScript app. Uh, maybe the majority of their app is JavaScript. And they rewrote it to be Basecamp 3, and uh, still, you know, a very large payload of JavaScript that comes along, as if you were writing a client-side web app, like you would expect those kinds of payloads. Uh, so it's not the case that they're not using JavaScript. Uh, it's just the case that they believe they have an integrated approach with JavaScript, where they can sort of lean on their uh, framework more. Which is interesting, and they're so resistant to client-side frameworks, uh, when they are so into server-side frameworks. So that is kind of the spiel on, on it's inevitable. Hopefully, like, nobody needs too much convincing there. Maybe the harder part is to argue that client-side rendering is simpler. And my approach to this is just to look at a few examples. Like, let's say you're making a master detail view. This is notes, uh, just notes from my uh, MacBook Pro. And on the very far left, you've got something you click on, you see more on the right. Then you click on something there, and you see more on the right. This is master detail. Uh, it's a super old. UI pattern. And to do this thing in Rails is uh, it's kind of tricky, or at least it's tricky in the sense that it changes uh, your Rails code quite significantly. Uh, and there's techniques for this. One of them is turbo links. You know, when you click that thing way on the left, maybe it's fine to render everything on the page, but when you incrementally click on that list, it's ridiculous to throw the entire page away and start it back up. So you can inject HTML in the middle. And you, know, you don't want to be doing a million queries every time you just click a small thing and expect a small thing to change. So you've got this Russian doll caching and there's techniques to do this. Uh, next up, like a star rating widget. I just copied and pasted this from uh, Amazon. For this, if you look at the guides, you'll say, okay, unobtrusive JavaScript snippet, which is really to say like you're on your own. Uh, go out there and sort of very imperatively, uh, you'll find this thing, all right, when you click this, perhaps put a class on that. Okay, now that's showing. Uh, okay, they clicked off of there, so maybe put a click on the body. Okay, now take it away. This really uh, imperative kind of UI programming that um, is really sort of antiquated and very hard to deliver non-buggy uh, interfaces with. Next up, fast form submissions. Let's say you got a to-do list. You want it to be fast, right? You want that Ajax stuff. Uh, so you do form four remote true and you got button two also, so that's there. The server will come back and say, here's your next note. And you can add it to the list. Uh, dynamic forms, I took this from a super old uh, Rails cast where you've got one question and uh, several answers, and you know, you, you add something, you go to the server, you get another one, you remove it, you say, hey server, remove that from, from the page. And the, the advantage here is that the server keeps track of all the templates, because otherwise you'd have to duplicate these templates on both sides, it'd be very scary. Um, but you know, the answer template, which here is very simple, can just live on the server. And I guess this was RJS, which is um, deprecated, and then I guess DHH calls it SJS, but I had to put the G in there and remember that it was server generated, uh, oh, JavaScript, response, I messed up, I put an extra S in there. Too confused. Uh, so, so that's kind of like, I don't know, maybe the sprinkles approach. So we, we've got this master detail ID, idea, okay, turbo links, Russian doll caching, maybe the star rating is just the UJS snippet, and then you got your fast form helpers and your button twos, and then you've got dynamic forms, you can just basically send things to your server and say, hey, start messing with my DOM. Uh, so it just feels to me kind of like build UI with these four weird sprinkle tricks. Uh, every time you come up with another UI problem, it's like you're inventing a whole new paradigm, right? Uh, of dealing with it on the back end. And you know, as a Rails developer, uh, this can feel fine because we've, we've learned all these things, right? On the back end and it's just incrementally one more thing, you know, just one more little thing to add and it's working on a base that you know. Uh, and stepping outside of that is pretty scary. Unless one day somebody comes to you and gives you some kind of like insane UI that just will not work with any of this stuff. And that actually happened with Basecamp and it was a calendar. So Basecamp had a calendar and they threw all that stuff away 
and decided to go with Backbone. And they hated it. I mean, he, DHH talked about how much he hated it. But you can imagine trying to build something like this without JavaScript would be uh, crazy. Uh, you know, you just click a little checkbox on the side and you kind of want all that blue stuff to go away. Like, wouldn't it be so simple to just toggle a class? Like, don't show the blue stuff or something. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, Backbone. That was the, was the answer they turned to. Um, so client-side development, as it's evolved today, kind of comes down to sort of build UI with this one weird trick. Sometimes I think this word's overused, talking about uh, primitives uh, in the sense of some kind of low-level idea that you can use to solve many problems, but I sometimes use it. So uh, the primitive here in a lot of these frameworks is components. And components is really, once you step back and look at it, like nothing very fancy at all. I mean, it could just be an object or a function. It takes some state and then gives you a representation of a DOM tree. Uh, and the other thing it can take is some functions, and it could call those functions and let other people know something happened. And all along the way, it just sort of keeps track of its own little UI world, and if you click on something in there, it can handle it there, it can do a callback, and that's components in a nutshell. <laughs> I've done it tons of justice. But when it comes to uh, rendering UI on the client, and you want to do a master detail list, like this is just components 101. I think the Ember page, this is like on the front page, is like five lines of code or something. And you know, the idea is you've got an outer component, and then let's say you click on one of those things in the list, it just like sends a different set of attributes to that inner component, and then it just changes. And you click over there, and more components, and, and it works. I mean, star rating, that would be like another introduction to components. Um, you know, you can imagine that you'd have like, are you hover over this thing, now the state like is showing drop down is true, so now that's showing, and you know, you have all your data and just kind of reflect that in the DOM tree. Uh, fast forms, like whatever, they're all fast, they're all use Ajax. Uh, and dynamic forms, it's just no different. I mean, it's components. You render that form on the client anyway just to add more things to it. It's just more of the same. Um, yeah, so you know, more of the same is kind of what I'm looking for when it comes to making UI. And you know, somebody's going to say stuff like, oh my gosh, like don't, don't break the back button, that sort of thing. Let's see if I can get this to play. Oh yeah, this is me uh, trying to figure out GitHub. I see I've got some notifications over there. And then I check, oh, I've got nothing. OK, that's fine. But I go back to work. Oh, wait, I do have notifications. No, no, I don't have any notifications. I mean, this happens to me so often. And I find these sorts of problems with hybrid web applications, like way more than I see them on client. I don't think I've seen this on a client-side web application in like three years, something that actually just broke the back button like that. Because um, that kind of stuff's baked in. And, and thought out and can actually be weirder with these hybrid apps. So I guess my point there is that client-side frameworks uh, render UI without breaking a sweat. And for Rails, uh, it sweats a little bit. <laughs> and I think, uh, you know, for most web applications, it's well worth your time to investigate these sorts of things and keep that separate from Rails if, if, you, if you're serious about building UI. So here's some like anti-rendering uh, arguments. These are the bad ones. I'll get to the good ones later. Uh, the first one that I like is uh, double MVC. So <clears throat> More things is bad is basically the idea here. Uh, you know, before in this wonderful world, you had your ORM models, your database, your routers, your controllers, and then your sprinkles, right? It's a sprinkle bucket, and then views. And uh, I kind of chose to uh, sort of put this middle end in there because in my opinion, uh, it's interesting that these routers and controllers are sort of, to me, living in between uh, UI and sort of what I think of as the back end. And that's because if the marketing team comes to you and says, we want a marketing page, like you go to your router and you make that URL, which seems like no big deal. Um, if somebody says, I want to render all the posts on the left and then the, a post in the middle, where well, you're going to need to go to your controller and make sure you, ha make sure you actually have all the posts. Um, you know, if you want a flash notification, that's going to go in your controller, all these sorts of things. You know, where are you going to go next? Well, you need to make sure that lives in the router. Uh, yeah, so <clears throat> the sprinkles thing over here, I mean, that is, to use another DHH term, basically a, a JavaScript junk drawer. Uh, I realized shortly after making this slide that perhaps this doesn't work because to have a junk drawer implies that you have other drawers so you actually put things in that has some kind of sense. So maybe it's just like, <laughs> I don't know, a bucket or something. Uh, but yeah, so this is how I think of the double MVC thing. Uh, the easy thing to point out here is just to say like, oh, I've got a router on the back end and a router on the front end. Like, oh, that's duplication. Um, well, it's not, because the router on the back end has to do with resources, and the router on the front end has to do with what your UI looks like. So if you decide that you, know, you want to render that list of posts on the left and a post in the middle, 
you can handle all, all that on your uh, front end UI router and never have to change your back end router. Uh, controllers, now they only deal with back end changes uh, primarily, unless you need a new feature or something like searching uh, for your back end. And then you've got your sprinkles just kind of get blown out, right, into three uh, separate things. And as we know in programming, like more classes is often not a bad thing. Uh, this, you know, cast my mind back to working uh, with WordPress and trying to add an icon to the login page. I mean, this stuff is just gnarly. This is like 1990s WordPress and, you know, the whole thing's in a giant switch statement. There's raw SQL queries in the template. It creates a temporary password for you with MD5. Uh, and there's some HTML in there, and if you want to add an icon, like that's where you go, <laughs> is into this file. And when you update WordPress, like you're in for a bad time, especially when they don't have source code uh, control, because uh, that icon is gone. <clears throat> so yeah, I guess I, I want to sort of appeal to these lofty programming principles, like you know, we separate things that have different rates of change, right? So like copy on your website changes often, that's almost like configuration, throw in 19, I18N, uh, the way you flat map over arrays is something that does not need to change very often. That's like buried in some utilities thing that you could reuse all over the place. And I sort of think about it as a macro SRP, single responsibility principle, you know, to say that the front end should only really change uh, when there's some kind of uh, UI that should change, like some kind of user experience thing that's changing. And the back end shouldn't necessarily need to change if, uh, and the, yeah, so the back end shouldn't need to change if there's, you know, something that's just like UI related. Now if, you know, let's say you've got like a business thing that needs to change, like all right, we only need to recognize revenue when we have proof of delivery, like that's totally all on the back end. But I think very interesting is maybe like UI flow on the front end. You know, where you go from page to page, as Rails developers, when we're building Rails apps, we might think of that as being very integrated with our back end, but it really can be uh, completely separated uh, from the back end, you know, where are the user's gonna go. So let's look at a quick uh, like Rails battleground, which is you know controllers. There's so many solutions to this stuff over the years, and to Rails uh, defense, they've really made this stuff really terse. Uh, but let's just look at like this is an update action from uh, scaffolding, and I stripped away all the stuff that's like if it's HTML, if it's XML, if it's JSON, because that's not going to fit on one slide. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so first thing we do is we make a post, or you know, we'll find this post that we're going to update. Seems great. Uh, interesting that it's an instance variable though, like why do we need an instance variable if we're just gonna update a post? Well, we might actually render that post later. So, instance variable. Authorize that post, good like back end thing to do. Uh, but what happens when that is not authorized? Maybe we re redirect, maybe we show a flash message, maybe there's something else we do. Uh, you know, something that the controller is gonna have to decide or one of its parents. <clears throat> And then we go and we update that post and we pile out all these errors onto the post and uh, oh, if it's bad, if it's good, then we're gonna go to post. But really like why go to post? Maybe we should go back to the list of posts. And I guess we want a flash message here, which a flash message is just like a hack because we keep losing state on the client every time we load the page, right? And what kind of, is it a notice, is it a warning? Um, that sort of thing is a decision you make here. And finally you render edit, which might be the right thing to do or not, depending on how your UI works. And uh, you know, make sure you've got all the data you need to render that template, uh, and that's you know more, more UI stuff. So if we took all that away, it wouldn't really look much different, uh, but it would be a little bit different. You know, first we don't need an instance variable, and we don't need to worry about well maybe we need to load a bunch of posts later because uh, this doesn't make sense. We're just updating a post. That's all you need is the post. When you authorize and it doesn't work, like 403 forbidden, that's the end of it, right? No marketing person's gonna come over and be like, I feel like that should be like I'm a little teapot or something. Um, <laughs> no, because that's the right thing and that's you know the right response to return. And how you want to dress that up, well that's like the client's problem. Uh, you update your post and then uh, return the representation of that post. This is, I assume, using active model serializers. And in the case that there's errors, we actually don't send the post back, just send the errors. And again, like unprocessable entity that's sort of coming down with this technical stuff is like, it's up to the client what it should look like, right? And why don't we send the post? Because we haven't lost that state on the client like we normally do. Um, so all we need to send is the errors. And you can almost start to see the inputs and outputs of this action, like, oh, okay, here's the params, and then I'm rendering this post and sending it out. So that's kind of the, the first argument. The second argument is duplicate logic. I hear this a lot. The first one that comes up is like validation. Like first I have to validate on my server and then I have to validate on my client. 
Well, like if we just look at how this works in two different scenarios, um, in both situations, you're going to add active record uh, validations to your model. And then both situations, you're going to pass that off to something that will kind of manipulate it. And for Rails, that might be a view with the object instance, uh, you know, an, uh, an instance variable. And then uh, for a client server architecture, you might send JSON, and I don't want to trivialize those differences, but um, you know, you send this data off, and then you render the views, you know, render the stuff in the view, or you render the errors inside of a component. So that is like just bare level validation, right? And that's not really what people mean when they make this argument. They say, well, I want like instant feedback. And I want, you know, only show those errors once the field is dirty. And I want like as they type, I want it to go away and like give them a green check mark when it's good. Uh, and some async updates at the same time. You know, don't let them submit if it's if it's not valid yet. Or maybe scroll them back to the top of the page and say, here's your errors. And what that is is a vastly improved user experience. And these, you know, this argument to me is silly because it's saying that we want all these all these new features and functionality, and claiming that the problem is duplicate logic when really it's just a difficult problem uh, to create this great user experience. And and you don't really have to duplicate yourself. Uh, you could knock yourself out with this. You could have some validations data that you pass to the front end. It could read off. Here's how long the username should be. And here's a regex to make sure my password has a a symbol in it or a number. And, and that's fine, but like that's just not even, that usually doesn't even make it on the radar of the kinds of problems uh, people have in the web apps because to duplicate like the number five on the front and the back end is usually just not, not a problem in my experience, but you, you can definitely work around it. The other thing is authorization rules. I'm willing to admit that perhaps I'm missing the boat on this because I see a lot of very popular front end authorization libraries that people use, but to me, this has always seemed very simple, and I haven't run into any case where this hasn't worked in the past three years, working exclusively with JavaScript apps. Uh, just let the server drive with status codes. So if you say, oh, I don't want this person to see this page, now I have to say, you know, on my server, if they go here, it's invalid. On my client, if I go here, it's invalid. Just let them go there on their client, and then say, 401 not you know, unauthorized or whatever, and send them back to the login page. Just let the server drive. The server keeps saying, you know, here's the truth, you're not authorized, and the client just says, all right, well, now what am I gonna do? I guess I should go back to the login page or just close the window, whatever. You know, it's up to the client. And if you've got like a situation where maybe you've got really granular permissions on an object, like, all right, this person can like view it and update it, but not delete it, that sort of thing. Um, again, just like pass that information along with your objects, like set some permissions on there, and if they can't delete it, don't show the delete button. So again, it's just sort of um, the server saying, you know, here's what you're allowed to do, and the client's saying, like, well, here's the best I can do with what the server uh, gave me. Here's what it looks like. So here are the completely valid arguments against uh, client-server apps. Uh, the first one is this, like, time to first paint on mobile, which is saying, like, when can I get that information to users' faces when they're using a mobile device uh, in my HTML app? And for Twitter, right, like, famously, this was a big problem uh, to parse JavaScript on a slow mobile phone several years ago. And to immediately show that stuff, I mean, that was like the most important thing of Twitter. Um, so a lot of people have been working on this problem. Uh, server rendered JavaScript apps, like this is a thing people do. I've worked at several companies that basically, they have something like this, that they just like deliver content uh, in a way that I personally would never have picked a JavaScript web app for, but they have done it and they've made it work. Uh, I will not say that that is a practical choice for everybody who's just building like a one-off app and doesn't have a lot of resources to throw at this problem. But it is getting better and better every day. Uh, the next argument, of course, is that I already have a giant server rendered app, right? I've got some legacy thing and you know, I can't throw it away and, and add a UI framework on top of it. Well, I, I do think that adding a UI framework is kind of a nice place to start uh, if you're thinking about a rewrite. You could kind of do like a half rewrite, although I'm kind of against rewrites in general. Uh, as a principle, but uh, you know, it's an interesting thing. You can have your back-end team uh, opening up APIs slowly, front-end team building an app that's consuming those, and there are ways to integrate uh, you know, JavaScript and, and server-side stuff together, but I'm not gonna lie, it's extremely painful. Uh, it, it can be tough. Uh, the next thing is that you know, method calls become a distributed problem. I think you know, for that DHH argument about integrated apps, this is like a big one, right? Before, I just had an object sitting in memory that I call, and now I have to send that over the wire. What if the network's down? Now I have error handling. I've got distributed data. When is this available? What if it's slow? Like all, all these sorts of things. And yeah, this is, this is like a, a hard problem. 
But to me, it's almost less of a technical problem because maybe like 10% of this pain is going to be technical. And the other 90% is going to be you attempting to design APIs. And of course, like you're going to do just a great job. But the guy next to you is just going to screw it up. And uh, you know, you're going to have to argue with him for like months and months. And then once you get in place, you're like, oh, yeah, this is sweet. All of a sudden, you're going to come up with a case like, uh, oh, I want to like delete this, but I just want to delete the relationship between these two things. I don't want to actually delete that. Like, oh, now I need to paginate. Where do we add that in the payload? Sorting, filtering. Uh, I want to have a compound document. How do I say that these two things are related? Uh, these things will come up. So just don't go it alone uh, when designing APIs. Check out jasonapi.org. Uh, it's a great, it's like an anti-bike shedding tool, uh, and it's, it's uh, pretty good. Uh, Facebook has Relay. Uh, Filecore is another thing that uh, Netflix has. So there's all these kinds of solutions. And this stuff, I think, is really the key to overcoming this barrier where uh, it is now practical to make these kinds of applications. Because when you can just say, I'm going to get all these posts, and you don't have to have like, month-long conversations about how you're going to serialize and what the endpoint should look like. Um, that's when you can really uh, start to speed up. Uh, the infrastructure nightmare and JavaScript fatigue, all that stuff, this is true. There's a lot of churn and things move too fast. Another reason to maybe separate your front end and back end app, there's a lot of higher rate of change on the front end uh, with all these tools. But I guess this is my little Ember shill here. I work with Ember a lot, and I think Ember has probably the best story around infrastructure uh, deployment, these sorts of things. Uh, so maybe check that out. So yes, so the, the benefits that you'll get um, that you might not think about, deploying your front-end and uh, back-end app separately is actually pretty amazing. Uh, really frees up your deployment process. If you can make a small CSS change and have a whole different team just deploy it and the back-end team never need to know about it. So they're not like, oh, sorry, we need to wait for this next release to come through before that button can turn green. Uh, there's all kinds of front-end development tricks you can do. I mean, there's all this like live reload fancy stuff. It's way faster than doing sprockets things. Uh, the, you know, you can test the heck out of your UI. Like when I did Rails development and was trying to shoehorn JavaScript in, testing was so hard. Like setting up these different runners and like trying to get that to run in CI. And you know, we ended up leaning a bunch on capybara tests, which were way too slow for the kind of unit tests we wanted to do. So we basically very rarely wrote unit tests for JavaScript stuff. And now, you know, you just run like thousands of these things super fast. Uh, it's, it's pretty great. Uh, I think for large teams, it's interesting to have another horizontal division. Like, you know, you have DevOps and those people on the back end that kind of can scale across the company. Like, if you have a different application, you might not need a different version of Apache or whatever. So you can use DevOps everywhere. And then you have back end. They can make one API, right? And that could maybe serve several different purposes. And then you've got front end people, and those kind of like are more specific. Now you've got like, all right, this is just this one particular app, one particular app, and so on. And then you have those people that used to you know, use Photoshop and dabble in HTML and CSS. Just send them to the marketing department. I don't like high fidelity mocks. It's a nightmare. So yeah, that is my argument, I guess, in, as, as well as I could do, that this should be a, a matter of course, that when you make your next web application, you should think to yourself, I'm probably going to separate the front end from the back end, um, if you have means to do that. And I think that's the default choice unless you've got a very good reason why not. And of course, I've come up with a lot of very good reasons uh, in my own head as I've worked throughout the years. Um, but hopefully next time you'll uh, try that new Rails 5 dash dash API feature and try building your one, M, uh, one web app uh, as if it were two web apps kind of from the beginning. All right. Thank you. That's it. <laughs> yeah, I should ask questions. Anyway. Questions? No one. Just laptop drop. Oh, yeah. Uh, have you integrated uh, something like Ember into an existing Rails app? And if so, do you have recommendations? Oh, yeah. I've got great recommendations. <laughs> I wrote a library. Uh, I did write a library uh, that some people use. Uh, I know it's used at Kickstarter and a few other places called Ember Islands that actually uh, works to bring in. Uh, components from Ember into your application gives you a kind of a smooth path to refactor. Um, the pro this, uh, really, to me, this is like, it's so similar to testing for me, uh, this sort of same idea. You know, it's like, it's like, how do I add tests a year later after I've written my whole app? And that's like way painful, right? 
Uh, you know, if you can, there's so many decisions you made, like you're gonna have to get your I18N stuff to the front, all your config stuff to the front, like how is this stuff gonna work? Like that's the battles you're gonna have to have. But yeah, technically, like I mean, I've, I've used that library before at companies to uh, shift over to JavaScript projects. I think people usually are like, we're gonna big bang rewrite it. And by the time I get there, it's like, oh no. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, but it's, it's really, really hard. I think that's probably a transition a lot of web apps are gonna have to go through in the next year or two. Yeah, yeah, I would say front-end routing is, is not RESTful in general. It, what's that? Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so when you've got like React's uh, router and Angular's old UI router, which is based on Ember's router, all these router things. Uh, the idea really there is that your, your URL ends up matching the nesting of your view. So you can imagine that perhaps you're in an authenticated template, so you've got like a header at the top that says like log in and log out. And then from there, it's maybe like, oh, that could be on your URL or not, but then from there, it's like slash posts. And now within that posts view, you know, you'll load all that post data, you'll know, have like another sort of view inside of that view. And then you'll go to an individual post, you might go to slash one, and then in there, you've got like your other little UI piece there. But those endpoint URLs could be completely different. Like the posts could be called articles. Maybe you'll just hit one endpoint and get all that data at once or something. I mean, uh, the resources are, are totally different. And the, the UI routing is all about actually how it looks and how do you want the back button to work. So those sorts of things. When you change, like if you want your modal window to match to a URL and you want people to be able to bookmark that, then that might not be very restful to add a query param that says like modal open or something. Uh, but if you want that, you want that to work with the back button and you want to bookmark that or something, uh, you know, you can do that with the UI router and Backend has no idea that you opened a mobile. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's all about how the UI looks, really, which is not, you know, say, way in the back, so far back. Yeah, I've never seen any of that microservice stuff go well, especially when you try to do it before you build the app, like try to guess what you think your services are gonna be. You used to be able to do a query with a join and now you're like map reducing over like multiple services and it's super slow. And sometimes one doesn't work, so what do you do? Uh, yeah, so I like, don't wanna trivialize that problem. I think things like JSON API and Relay, uh, it makes those things very integrated so that you, you, know, you know exactly what the error format is going to be. It's like if you get a 500 error, like it will be in this format and I can at least show it to the user at this bar. Or if I get validation errors, it'll be in this exact format according to the specification and show it you know, to my UI. So like, yeah, I definitely lean on those things, but yeah, not to trivialize the distributed data problem. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm sure a lot of people would say, yeah, I mean, like, re you know, make uh, separate React apps. Uh, like, I've seen people use Ember Islands to, like, just embed them on certain blog posts, like embed apps and that sort of thing. Uh, that's definitely possible. But I think that's a middle step because you're going to end up with some situations where, like, one widget and another widget need to talk to each other. You know, you've already loaded all your posts, and now it's like, well, this widget also needs those posts. Am I going to make another API call? Um, you know, they all might need to interact with the same, you know, URL in your bar. I mean, yeah, when you, when you play that game of like islands of richness, I think is that pattern that Backbone really tried to lean on for a while. Um, it works for these one-off situations, but as soon as you need sort of this full integration of like, all right, I've got data on my client and I need the URL to work and I don't want to deploy like 15 apps, <laughs> that sort of thing, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was thinking more in the context of like, you have two fully, you know, two or five fully separate apps, you don't want to load Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, that's a tricky problem. I mean, uh, so I work mostly with Ember, and I know that Ember has this concept of engines, which are like, thankfully, very different than Rails engines, but they borrowed the name. Uh, and the idea there, yeah, is like, let's say you got an admin section of your app, right? And then like a front end section, maybe one off other section or something. So yeah, you know, there you could start and load a bunch of stuff, and maybe some of those dependencies are the same, like they both use moment.js or something. Uh, and then there's like ways to kind of load these things lazily so that you don't just bombard everybody with all the, the JavaScript at once. So there are techniques to do this, to slice this up, and sometimes they call it like tree shaking and stuff like that. Um, but generally, I guess I haven't worked on any apps that big yet that have needed that. That might change uh, starting tomorrow, but uh, we'll find out. Yes. Yeah, uh, I'm like tempted to show code, but then I'm like, no. I probably have nothing here that's safe for that. Uh, yeah, so I mean, all I can do is, is think of examples. Like, uh, let's say you're on the front end and like, uh, so I, th I think I see what you're saying. It's like, well, if you go and like you edit a post or whatever, I mean, you could go to like a slash approve page or something on the front end, um, or like a great job you did it page or something like after you submit instead of showing a flash message. And all those URLs which have to do with UI, like the great job you did at page, I'm like that might not need any new information from the back end. Uh, you know, you don't have to great job you did at model on your back end. Uh, it's just like a different thing that's totally, you know, UI. Yeah, I mean, what would you ask for from the back end though? You say, show me the HTML, I guess. And the whole point here is like, you know, HTML is like UI. And yeah, it's, it's interesting. It really frees up URLs because that was always kind of a conflict for me is like, oh, this is not resourceful. Like this URL is bogus. Um, I mean, you could have like these super clean resourceful URLs on the back end. It's just like, this is the index, post, put, like all these things, yeah. Well, is it right to say that like, uh, so you're focused on the, the URLs on the front end, but I think maybe a different way to look at it is the URLs on the back end now just become like, they're basically just, they're super simple. You don't even think about them. Like they're the same for every type of resource. Yeah. And so if you really want, yeah. It's, it's not that you're doing different routes on the front end, it's that the routes on the back end are just like, you don't even have to think about them. Like, no, that's what, yeah. yeah. But it's, it's still a map, there's some map in there. There's gotta be something. Yeah. Something you got to what? Yeah, right. I mean, if I have like a like a slash like modal thing that like when you click on this it shows a modal form, I mean. Okay, maybe maybe it's like a philosophical thing that I'm just like not in tune with right now. Maybe that's it. Anything else? Ah. Uh oh. Rails helpers. Path helpers, huh? I mean, so the only reason I could think in the kind of web application I'm thinking about here, I'm talking about like the only reason I could think of to use path helpers would be if you're trying to do like a hypermedia type thing where you're sending along URLs to the client to let them know like where to get comments or that sort of thing. But you don't, I'm assuming you don't mean that. Because That is an option. However, like also you could 